And we are back with the second half of the chemistry of killing. So here are the element-based poisons that we're going to be talking about. So to start off with, we have thallium, um, which was Greek for a green shoot. Uh, really nothing green about it. Uh, you can see there's a purified form of thallium in the upper left-hand corner, kind of this silvery gray material. The bottom right just shows you the, the packing of these atoms at the molecular level. Thallium really is never administered as just the metal. It's going to be administered as the cation. So we have either thallium chloride, thallium sulfate, or thallium acetate. Um, I also apologize. Uh, Prezi does not allow you to do subscripts and superscripts, which is why uh, uh, these look so weird. So apologies for that. Um, you can see that LD50s are all fairly similar, but it does matter what the anion is. So. As far as thallium goes, it's found in the crust at around 0.6 parts per million. So what does that mean, parts per million? That means that if you had a million grams of crust, approximately 0.6 grams of it would be thallium. So not a whole hell of a lot. Um, generally found in these three main minerals, crookside, hutchinsonite, and lorendite. Um, so you can see that it's combined with various other chemicals and crookside, copper and selenium, and Hutchinsonite. It's bound with lead, arsenic, and sulfur, and then Morandite with arsenic and sulfur in different uh, compositions. So generally, this is no longer mined, uh, as it were. Generally, it's created synthetically in a lab, but where it used to be produced um, is actually in Macedonia, which is the tiny, tiny country that we're centered on right there, so just north of Greece. So how does this work? Um, turns out that thallium has a very, very strong appetite for cysteine. So cysteine is the molecule shown in the upper right-hand corner there. Um, that's important because cysteine is very prevalent in ferrodoxin cages. And so a ferrodoxin cage is shown here. Generally, this is an iron sulfur cage. And so the big red balls represent iron, and then the yellow balls are supposed to represent sulfur. So if you end up having thallium in your system, that's going to disrupt this ferrodoxin. And that's a problem because this is shown for chloroplast, so this is for a plant, but the exact same thing exists in uh, animals as well, is ferrodoxin is part of an electron transport system. And the whole point of this transport system is so that you can make ATP, which is again kind of the, uh, the energy molecule that we have to use in order do anything. So if we disrupt ferrodoxin, we can no longer synthesize ATP, and so your cell no longer will have a source of energy, which is of course going to eventually lead to death. So our symptoms here would be nausea, vomiting, diarrhea, again your body is trying to excrete this toxin, headaches, um, depending on the level, possibly hallucinations begin to set in, so it does affect a little bit the central nervous system, as well as convulsions, eventually resulting in a loss of hair. So, thallium is known as the poisoner's poison, primarily because it is colorless, it is odorless, and it is tasteless, so it's very, very hard to detect. So our first case takes us to, again, the United Kingdom. Apparently a lot of horrible people live here with, uh, with very bad teeth, that goes the joke, I guess. So this is a picture of Graham Young, who is referred to as the teacup poisoner because uh, he used to put thallium in people's tea when they're drinking it, and that's how we generally administer the, the, uh, the thallium. So Graham Young uh, is a weird guy. Uh, he grew up in the London area. And he used both antimony as well as digitalis, which is a poisonous plant that we did not talk about. But he used both of these things to poison his family growing up. So he had a father, a few siblings, as well as a stepmother. He actually killed his mom, or sorry, he killed his stepmom, as well as got the rest of his family sick. But since he was underage at the time, he ended up getting uh, basically sent to a boarding school as a word for reform uh, before being let out later. Um, he ended up working, after he got out, at John Hadlin Labs, which had access to lots and lots of thallium. Um, and strangely enough, his employers at this lab had no idea that uh, he had been in this um, kind of reform school for having poisoned 
uh, his family. So as soon as he started working for this laboratory, lots and lots of his colleagues ended up coming down with uh, various sicknesses from being poisoned. And he was a creepy guy as well. He actually took uh, notes as far as how much of thallium, how much of other various poisons he was administering to his colleagues. So he actually ended up killing two of his colleagues before uh, being convicted uh, of murder. Our second case takes us to Florida, and that of George Trapal. So George Trapal lived in the neighborhood and ended up having a family move in next door, um, the Carr family, Perry and Peggy Carr who also had a few, some children. Peggy Carr started suffering symptoms of thallium poisoning in October, and ended up dying in March of 89. So again, it can actually take a fairly long time before you die from this. Um, no joke, of course, this would be a very painful way to go. Um, before this happened, uh, the Carr family had received various letters uh, that never had any names associated with them, but inside it was always this idea that, hey, you need to leave the neighborhood or I'm going to kill you. Uh -huh. So, after she passed away, of course, authorities were trying to find out who had poisoned her, and upon searching uh, George Trapal's garage, they had basically ended up finding what amounted to a small laboratory of its own, so like a kind of a small meth lab, as it were. And if this is your own personal meth lab, Walter White does not approve. It is not clean as it should be. So they ended up finding Coke bottles both in his house as well as over in the car house. And so the cars didn't actually lock their house up all the time, so there's lots of cases where he could be easily gone over there. And apparently what the police think, of course, is that he came over there, opened up some Coca-Cola bottles, dropped in the thallium, and that's what led to the poisoning. The next case takes us to New Jersey. And Tianli Li. So she poisoned her husband, and she did this because there are some friction in the family as far as kind of this Eastern culture colliding with Western culture. He wanted to get a divorce. She did not want to get a divorce. She worked at Bristol Myers Squibb, which is a very well known chemical company and would allow her easy access to thallium. And so she ended up poisoning her husband, but playing the good of the playing the role of the good wife, she actually stayed with him throughout his ordeal, even changing his bedpan on occasion. Uh, they finally found that she also kept a diary, just like Graham Young, as far as dosages that were being given to her husband and the symptoms that went along with that. And so very, very carefully plotted his death. <clears throat> so those are some thallium poisonings. Next we move on to arsenic. Again, arsenic, typical of most metals, kind of has this off gray color. The LD50 for arsenic trioxide in rats is 15 milligrams per kilogram. As far as in the earth crust, the arsenic exists at around 1.5 parts per million. So for every, again, a million grams of crust, you would have about 1.5 grams of arsenic. So about three times more prevalent than 1,000. It's found generally in mineral form as either arsenopyrite, where it's combined with iron and sulfur or in real gar and orpiment, where it's only combined with sulfur. So in this case, between those two, the arsenic exists in a couple different oxidation states. So arsenic is generally produced mostly by China, as well as by Peru, with most other companies coming in at far below their domestic productions. Um, arsenic, of course, is problematic, and it's good, at least as far as from a poisoning standpoint, because it's um, so prevalent throughout that a lot of times poisoning can be overlooked because uh, maybe you're just poisoned from the normal amounts that exist, say, in groundwater. So these dots are just supposed to show you as the dots get darker and darker and darker, that's where you have higher and higher levels of arsenic. Um, so you can see that Michigan, uh, is basically has arsenic all over the place. 
Um, but where we are, we don't really have any data. Um, but in North Carolina, at least, there seems to be high levels of arsenic. Most likely, uh, we would also have elevated levels, at least in the mountainous areas of South Carolina. Probably we're not too, not too bad here on the coast. <clears throat> So how does arsenic work? So it's an inhibitor for a metabolic enzyme, PDH. So PDH is pyruvate dehydrogenase. And what pyruvate dehydrogenase does is it converts pyruvate into acetyl coenzyme A, which is just a whole other molecule in a series of molecules in the Krebs cycle, which basically, again, allow you to produce ATP. So this is like a precursor to ADP. So if you can't make a precursor to ATP, of course you can't make ATP. And so point being that you can no longer produce energy for your cells. That's bad. The other thing that it does is it, via a process that's not very well understood, is it increases the amount of hydrogen peroxide that is produced by the, the body. And so hydrogen peroxide is produced by the body and then converted into uh, hypochlorous acid, and that acid is used generally to kill any invading bacteria or anything that the cell finds harmful, tries to use it to oxidatively degrade it. So of course if you have a high level of hydrogen, hydrogen peroxide in your body, you're going to put your own cells under oxidative stress, and of course that ends up being very, very bad. <clears throat> So symptoms of uh, arsenic poisoning are headaches, confusion, again, diarrhea, cramping, vomiting, blood in the urine, and again, loss of hair. And so we're going to do a timeline here because arsenic has been used so prevalently throughout history primarily due to its ease of access. So this is ancient Rome, the ancient Roman Empire, of course, extended across much of Europe as well as Northern Africa into Turkey, mostly a tourist site at these points. <laughs> but back in the day, um, there were so many poisonings occurring, and some of them, again, can be attributed to arsenic, the use of these minerals that contain arsenic. And of course, nobody knew anything back then as far as what was poisonous, what wasn't, what was good for your body, what wasn't. And so arsenic-containing minerals were used a lot of the time to try to treat to other maladies that people were suffering. So in some cases, it was intentionally used to murder. In some cases, it was just people accidentally poisoning themselves. So a decree was sent out at some point by Cornelius called the Lex Cornelia de Securis et Beneficis, in which, of course, that is not pronounced correctly at all. But basically this was a law that forbade people from killing people using poison. In some cases this was also referred to as magic at the time. A quote attributed to Cornelius is, no friend ever served me and no enemy ever wronged me whom I have not repaid in full, which I thought was kind of a, an interesting quote. I like that one. Um, this brings us up to Pedanius Dioscorides. And so this was basically a guy who was a scientist, at least of his age, who went around with various armies, uh, Roman armies, and documented both minerals as well as plants and animals. And so his book that he ended up um, basically uh, compiling um, was really the pharmacological text of its day, and it would be used really for the next, uh, uh, next 1,500 years until um, the time of the Renaissance before being replaced by more updated texts. Um, so he actually elucidated the use of arsenic uh, as far as its use to treat various maladies. Um, he um, basically worked uh, under generals during the time of Nero's rule over in Rome. Um, Nero, of course, um, very famous as he was the emperor during the burning of Rome. Um, of course, Rome has burned lots and lots of times. But people, for whatever reason, blame Nero a lot. Uh, he tried to shift the blame. Of course, he didn't set fire to Rome, but people think that he didn't do enough to stop it. But who he ended up blaming was the Christians. Speaking of the Christians, we have the bourgeois. Uh, so this is Alexander VI. So he was the pope of the Holy Roman Catholic Church during the Renaissance. His son, Caesar, there, shown on the right, he was in charge of the papal army, and then 
his daughter the cruise he has shown in the middle. And again, some of this may or may not be reliable from a historical account because again, um, you write your own history is that lest you have your enemies write them for you. So their history is very much written by their enemies, uh, people who did not like the extension of the Pope's power, did not like how he ran things at the time, but he was accused, of, both he as well as his brother were accused of poisoning various people. And basically the premise being that once the person died, their belongings were transferred over to the church. And so this was how they were able to enrich themselves. A couple other historical figures of note, uh, Napoleon Bonaparte, of course the well-known French general, um, was found uh, when testing was done later on his remains to have the elevated concentrations of arsenic. Um, they don't think he was technically poisoned. Again, arsenic was very common, and in this case I think the poison actually came from arsenic that was contained um, in his dwellings while he was on St. Helena during his exile. Another person that they believe arsenic poisoning may have killed or may have been murdered by is Jane Austen, a famous author. In some of her letters, she actually describes in detail various symptoms that she was suffering, and they very much correlate with what would be expected of arsenic poisoning. Um, but again, no foul play is implicated. Possibly she was just exposed to high levels of arsenic from some other source. However, where arsenic probably was the instrument of death, and as far as probably was intentional, was the death of Charles Francis Hall here, shown on the right. He was a famous explorer who went up to the Arctic several times. Um, kind of an a-hole on his third trip up there. There was kind of a division in the crew as far as how he was running things. So this is a picture of Dr. Bessel, who was kind of the medical member of that um, exploration. And Hall accused him of poisoning him because, of course, being the medical doctor, he would have access to the chemicals. Um, but Francis Hall ended up dying. Um, but Bessels was never implicated as far as in murder. Then. Um, the end game ended up being that he died of quote unquote natural causes, and whether that's true or not is up for debate. Where it's not up for debate is in the case of Masumi Hayashi, shown here. Um, she was a cook during a large celebration occurring in the Sonobi district of Wakayama in Japan, and she ended up poisoning the curry that was being served to all the people that were at this event, ended up being a bit into the curry. She put a thousand grams of arsenic. That's right, a thousand grams. So the reason that she did this is suspected that it was because um, nobody liked her family. She kind of been alienated by her neighbors, and so this was kind of a form of retribution, I suppose. So two children and two adults ended up dying from this. Um, 63 others ended up having illnesses associated with arsenic poisoning. And of course, she was convicted. The last case here is Michael Cormier, the bespectacled man shown here. Michael Cormier worked as a coroner out in L.A. And famously, he died on the exact same day that the autopsy report was to be released on Andrew Breitbart. Andrew Breitbart, of course, is a very renowned conservative speaker who also suddenly died after seemingly being in perfect health. Um, of course, these various things have been debunked, supposedly. Right, Bart suffered a massive heart attack a few months before he dropped dead. Um, and actually, Cormier had no interaction as far as the autopsy report on Breitbart. He just happened to work at the same hospital that it was being done at. Um, so, of course, lots of conspiracy theorists are trying to bring those two together as far as this mysterious death of Breitbart, primarily because of his views on the Obama administration. So he was a a member of the Tea Party, and he died right before he was able to release uh, damaging video, at least of Obama back in college days, interacting with uh, supposedly radical activists. Um, so there's some dispute about whether uh, Cormier was murdered and by who, because again, 
it would be hard to get that amount of arsenic without kind of tipping off somebody. Um, so that's still an unsolved mystery as well. So those are the arsenic poisons. Uh, that leads us to polonium. <clears throat> so polonium is a radioactive element um, found in cigarettes of all places generally. It has a very, very low LD50, less than one microgram per kilogram for rats. So this is radioactive, uh, hence the imagined dragons referenced. Yeah, yay. So where is this found? Well, um, it's generally not found. It's not in high enough abundance to really be found naturally. If it is found naturally, it's generally in small amounts found in pitch blend, which is nominally uranium dioxide. Uh, you guys can see in the little diagram at the bottom there that how polonium is produced these days is generally by bombarding bismuth with beta particles, and that's how you can synthetically produce polonium. <clears throat> So how does this work? I wanted to be able to zoom in on these pictures, but hopefully you guys can see this. Polonium works, of course, to destroy the body by basically being radioactive once you have it inside you. So polonium degrades into lead by the release of an alpha particle. And the alpha particle very much looks like the nucleus of a helium atom. It consists of two protons and two neutrons. Now, in general, alpha particles aren't that bad. It doesn't really take that much to block them. Generally, alpha particles have problems even traveling through a sheet of paper. The problem, of course, is if you ingest polonium, you have no such protection, so those alpha particles are going to start damaging your cell. And so what occurs is that you either have an indirect route or a direct route that's shown there in the bottom. The indirect route is the radiation causes a hydrogen-oxygen bond in water to be cleaved, forming a free radical, which then can go on and damage your DNA or the alpha particle can directly damage the DNA. And of course, once you start damaging the DNA, that starts leading to cancer, which eventually starts leading to death. And so symptoms associated with polonium poisoning are just the sense of nausea, again, vomiting, diarrhea. They seem to come up as symptoms all the time. Again, hair loss. And so a couple incidents of polonium poisoning. The most famous one is Alexander Litvinenko. So Alexander Litvinenko used to work for the FSB, which is a secret service um, brigade over in Russia. And he started to become critical of working for the FSB because basically he thought that they were being run as kind of a terrorist organization against their own people. And this kind of came to a head when the FSB was ordered to try to assassinate the oligarch and oil tycoon Boris Berezovsky, who is shown in the picture there in the middle left. Um, he eventually fled to London and also accused the Russian government of trying to murder journalist Anna Politkovskaya. Politkovskaya. <laughs> that was awful. <clears throat> and during his time outside of Russia, he wrote a couple of books, one of which was called Blowing Up Russia, Terror from Within, in which he basically talks about various terrorist acts and ascribes them to the Russian government. Of course, you can imagine that this did not sit well with the head of the Russian government, uh, Vladimir Putin. And so one day while in London, he actually met with two former members of the KGB and soon thereafter fell ill and started basically to waste away as the polonium started to degrade his body. Of course, you can see that he's lost all his hair. Um, ended up forming various types of cancer and ended up dying. <clears throat> Someone who is a reportedly assassinated by polonium was Yasser Arafat. So Yasser Arafat, of course, is the well-known leader of the Palestinian Liberation Organization, as, as well as kind of the nominal head of the Palestinian Palestinian Liberation Army. Um, and of course, Palestine is very much concerned, very much concerned with the West Bank and Jerusalem, of course, the Gaza Strip, all these uh, uh, well-known religious territories. Um, and so he actually worked very closely with his um, Israeli counterpart, Shimon Peres, 
uh, to try and bring peace to the area. So while he may have started out uh, very much on the radical side of things, he was seen by a lot of the Arab world as kind of a moderate, which may have done him in. Uh, but he and Perez shared the Nobel Peace Prize. But he ended up uh, falling ill and then dying in November 11, 2004. And elevated levels of polonium were found in his body, just like they were from the Lingo, except in this case, nobody has been implicated as far as the murder goes. And lastly, uh, for polonium poisoning, radiation poisoning, we do have uh, Commander Spock. So Spock actually served on the Enterprise and ended up having issues when the Enterprise ran into contact with Khan. And so, of course, Khan was able to disable the Enterprise and was going to end up having the Enterprise die in the massive explosion uh, resulting from the Genesis project going awry. But thankfully, Spock saved, uh, saved everybody by risking his life to fix the reactor core by going in there personally. Uh, but Spock ended up suffering too much radiation exposure and ended up dying. And this is their, his final moments with his friend James Tiberius Kirk um, as they say goodbye to one another. So he was given a, a nice torpedo burial at space and was launched out of the Enterprise. Our last case of poisons is synthetic-based. So these would be chemicals that are produced in the lab and that are not found naturally, except possibly in very, very small quantities. So the first one is hydrogen cyanide. So in the middle there is the cyanide anion, which is really the culprit for most of the damage that this compound does. Negatively charged carbon nitrogen triple bond. Hydrogen cyanide production was really, um, really came into its own once the Anderso oxidation was discovered by uh, Dr. Anderson, shown in the picture. And this work was done in IG Farben, which was a chemical company in Germany. Um, so on a yearly basis, most countries, and of course the U.S. does as well, produce millions upon millions of tons of hydrogen cyanide. So Cyan Code, Pont, Dow, all these chemical companies produce tons and tons of this, uh, this chemical. And generally it's used uh, to form nitrile polymers. Um, one word for you kids, plastics. The LD50 for this is 1.52 milligrams per kilogram of oral, oh, much, much higher if it has to go through the dermal layer. So how this works is generally cyanide has a very, very strong appetite for heme groups. So there's a heme group shown on the left. This is iron and porphyrin ring. And very much is similar to say carbon monoxide poisoning. So where oxygen would normally bind to the iron center in heme, now cyanide is going to bind to it. And it's going to bind to it irreversibly. So once it binds, it is not going to come off. And this is going to be a problem for cytochrome C oxidase, which is the pretty picture that's shown here. So how this works is cytochrome C, of course, contains several of these hemes, whether they have iron or whether they have copper, but they're used in order to, again, transport electrons in order to basically use oxygen. So you can see the end game there is oxygen is being converted into water. So if it binds to these heme groups, they can no longer allow this electron transport system to occur, therefore your body can no longer process oxygen that is going to very, very quickly lead to cell death because again, we have to be able to process oxygen in order to be able to synthesize ATP, to be able to synthesize energy for your body to be able to use. So that screws up again the electron transport chain, just like we saw with the ferrodoxin when that gets screwed up. <clears throat> So this generally leads to symptoms of, again, a malaise, tiredness, headaches, problems breathing, eventually will lead to coma. And where hydrogen cyanide was really uh, came to the foray of uh, the general populace, it was of course during the Holocaust. Um, so this was, of course, perpetrated by 
the Nazis, the Third Reich. So here we have a picture of Hitler and some of his journals as they go through the soldier ranks. And so where this occurred at was at the concentration camp. So of course these are Jewish children. And we have some Jewish adults shown. Of course, none of them look extremely healthy. Everybody is exceptionally thin, wasting away. And this is a picture which may as well be um, a picture to hell, as it were. So this is showing the train tracks that would take the freight cars full of Jewish prisoners into the concentration camp. So this is an entryway into Auschwitz, which might as well be called the gates of hell. And this is very famously one of the gas chambers where large numbers of Jewish prisoners would be taken and then gassed with hydrogen cyanide, resulting in mass burials. A strange twist of fate is that hydrogen cyanide was also used as a suicide agent by various high-ranking members of the Third Reich. So starting in the upper left and going to the right, Erwin Wommel, the famous general, committed suicide via hydrogen cyanide pill. Eva Braun, who was Hitler's girlfriend at the time, committed suicide with hydrogen cyanide. Hitler went that extra step, and while eating a hydrogen cyanide tablet, shot himself in the head with his pistol. Heinrich Himmler is shown next, and then Hermann Göring, and then probably the worst of all, the family that's shown in the bottom is Joseph Goebbels. He and his wife committed suicide with hydrogen cyanide, but not before murdering their children with the exact same substance and before putting them to bed forever. So as a strange twist of fate, hydrogen cyanide, which was used to kill millions upon millions of people, also took the lives of the same people that were perpetuating that. Next on the list are nerve agents. These nerve agents are classified as weapons of mass destruction. And there are two different series, the G-series as well as the B-series. The G-series, the first one that was produced was the molecule that is shown, which is sarin. And this was produced by Gerhard Schrader, and it's called the G-series, sometimes formerly known as the German series, because these were first synthesized at, again, IG Farben, this, uh, this uh, chemical company under Nazi control during World War II. Now, these are non-persistent nerve agents, and what that means is that they will degrade over time. And the LD50 for these is, again, fairly low, 50 to 70 milligrams per kilogram. The V-series, on the other hand, which is sometimes said the same for victory, for God knows what region, was actually produced first by Ranajit Ghosh at ICI, which was the imperial chemical industry, which was actually over in the United Kingdom. And you can see that the main structural difference between the G-series and the B-series is that instead of having a phosphorus-oxygen single bond, there is now a phosphorus-sulfur single bond. And that's what changes it from being non-persistent to persistent. It is extremely hard to cleave that bond. The LD50 for the V-series is about 100 times more lethal than the G-series, so 0.1 to 0.2 milligrams per kilogram for the LD50 for V-series. So the molecule that's shown here is what is normally referred to as VX or VX liquid. So these are nerve agents, and how they work is by inhibiting acetylcholinesterase enzyme. And that enzyme is shown here. So it's actually going to make it to where this no longer functions properly. So acetylcholinesterase is the protein that basically, as long as acetylcholine is around in that synaptic cleft, it can keep on binding to receptors and allowing various things to occur by either allowing ions to pass through or, or basically stimulating G proteins to do some kind of other function. So we can't have them be there forever, so what acetylcholinesterase does is as soon as they get released in the synaptic cleft, any of them that bind to the acetylcholinesterase will actually get cleaved back into acetate and choline, which then gets recycled back into the axon. So if you can't recycle acetylcholine, 
So basically, if you can no longer cleave that, it's going to stay in that synaptic cleft and basically continually, continually interact with the receptors, which is going to be a problem because it can no longer stop. <clears throat> Um, so this would be normal um, acetylcholine esterase working. So that's acetylcholine that's shown. It ends up binding to that esterate site and ends up cleaving the molecule into the choline version, which floats away and then into the acetate, which then gets um, hydrolysized back into just free acetate as well as OH on the acetylcholine esterase protein. That does not work very well when the VX is around. And so it will actually just sit there and it's very, very hard to get it to move. So it's this very slow hydrolysis, it just blocks it. And that basically means that acetylcholine can no longer get into that pocket and get cleaved in two. It takes a long, long time for that to get out of there. And at that point, you're probably going to die beforehand. <clears throat> So basically, your body loses complete control over any of its functions. You start salivating uncontrollably. You start crying uncontrollably. You urinate yourself as well as defecate yourself. You have uncontrolled snot coming out of your nose. And uh, where these were first used, and they haven't been used often because they're so awful, and of course, are international laws against their use because they are classified as weapons of mass destruction, was in the Iraq-Iran War in the 80s. And so this is a, a picture of some of the combatants. Um, in the upper right-hand corner, you can see that some of the uh, soldiers are actually prepared for the use of possibly chemical agents. In general, that would be mustard gas, but this was the first time that sarin, as well as possibly taboon, as well as possibly VX were used. Um, so again, this war was between Iraq and Iran. So in the lower left, you can see Saddam Hussein in the lower left-hand picture. And then you can see the Ayatollah Khomeini on the right, who was the leader of the Iran uh, government. Um, so the idea was that the invasion or the war first started right after all the political upheaval, the turmoil in Iran. And so Iraq thought that it would be able to easily take Iran on during this political upheaval because they wouldn't have no kind of centralized form to be able to deal with the invasion. Um, of course, they did and they repelled them, and then the war ended up lasting for another seven years. So where the chemical attack actually took place was much, much later in 1988. And it came to um, the US government that Iran was going to go on a large counteroffensive. And the analysis was that they would most likely be able to break through and start taking um, Iraqi cities. Um, the US, of course, uh, was not a fan of this. At the time, we were back in Saddam Hussein. And always funny how our allegiances shift over time. And so U.S. Uh, government gave the location of a large number of Iranian troops to the Iraqis. And this was in Halaba in northeastern Iraq. And due to their knowledge now of where this large number of Iranian troops were, a large you know, contingent of Iraqi MiGs and Mirages, fighter planes, dropped bombs on the area. And these bombs contained, again, some basically chemical cocktail of sarin, taboon, VX, and also cyanide. So the estimates that came out of this afterward were anywhere between 3,200 and 5,000 people died from this attack, and 7,000 to 10,000 people were affected by this gassing. Um, and as you can expect, most of these casualties ended up being civilians. Where this was also used was by terrorists who occupied um, Alcatraz. And they were actually trying to hold the US government hostage by planning to shoot missiles over major cities, the one being shown, of course, is San Francisco, with rockets that were filled, that were filled with uh, VX liquid that would then explode over the city, becoming an aerosol and infecting a large proportion of the populace. Thankfully, though, 
Nick Cage and Sean Connor were able to stop this terrorist plot, and so nobody in San Francisco ended up being infected by VX. The last thing that we're going to talk about is not technically a poison, but it's still based off of chemistry, and this is the nuclear bomb. So what this graph is showing you is basically how stable a nucleus is. And so you can see iron is at the very, very top of this graph. And so that means that it has the most stable nucleus. And that's why a large proportion of the elements on planet Earth are actually iron, because it is the most stable nucleus out of all of the elements. So if you go to the right of iron, that's how much energy you can produce from fission, basically breaking up an atomic nucleus. And then you can see if you go to the left, that's the amount of energy that you can produce by fusing nuclei into ever larger nuclei. And so you can see that fission does release a large amount of energy, but fusion releases a even much, much larger amount of energy. And the LD50 is, uh, well, <laughs> don't get caught next to a nuclear blast, huh? So, where we really run into this, of course, is going to be the US and the UK, as well as Russia, China, India, and also France. All of these countries have means of production as far as producing either a fission bomb or a fusion bomb. So how this works is for a fission is we're going to take uranium. Uranium is naturally radioactive. And we can force it to basically start to split apart if we just fire some high energy neutrons into that uranium nucleus. So that nucleus is going to split. And during its split, it's going to give off more neutrons, which will then interact with more uranium nuclei, which will then again split other ones and continually release a neutron more and more. So this is a chain reaction. <clears throat> And so how this works is a either gun type assembly or implosion assembly will allow you to get to basically a critical mass of the radioactive element. And so for the gun type assembly, a small blast basically forces two halves of uranium together, reaches critical mass, and that's when the chain reaction starts. Alternatively, implosion, you have a conventional explosive is arranged um, basically are in a sphere around the core, which again pushes the core together, reaches critical mass, and that's what starts the chain reaction. Fusion, on the other hand, is again where we're making bigger nuclei. So here we have deuterium and tritium. Um, these are two isotopes of hydrogen. And when they come together, they will make helium, as well as release a neutron, as well as a large amount of energy in that process. So again, just think of the sun. The sun is doing this exact same process. Is the sun releasing a whole lot of energy? You bet your damn ass it is. So a fusion bomb works a little bit differently. It actually has two separate components. One is a fission component, the other is a fusion component. So the little eyeball on top, kind of looks like an eyeball anyway, is the fission bomb. And so the fission bomb first gets detonated and it releases a whole bunch of radio active um, material, mostly neutrons, as well as a lot of heat. Um, this gets sent back down to that second core and basically causes it to implode as well, starting the fusion reaction, which then that releases a whole bunch of heat, as well as their radioactive products such as neutrons. And that causes the fission process to go to an even greater completion. So for fusion type bombs, around half of the explosion is due to the fission process, about half of it is due to the fusion process. Almost all nuclear warheads these days are the fusion type and not the fission type, just because they are so much more efficient in their release of energy. So of course there are only two cases where nuclear arms were actually used as far as not being just a test to see if it worked. And of course that was at the end of World War II in Japan, in both Hiroshima as well as Nagasaki. And so 
This is a picture of Little Man, and it was a gun-type fission bomb. And this is a shot from the plane after it had dropped the bomb, the explosion, the uh, kind of typical mushroom cloud that resulted above Hiroshima. And of course, nothing gets left after that. And so again, we're talking about mid-40s Japan. Most of the houses are made out of wood. Of course, they're not going to be able to withstand any type of blast. Um, the bomb that was dropped in Nagasaki was called Fat Boy. It was an implosion type fission reaction. And again, the same kind of thing, and nothing is left. So this resulted in over 200,000 civilian deaths. So this wasn't even directed at any type of army or navy or anything. This was just based off of seeing if we could end the war quickly by basically vaporizing a large number of innocent people. Of course, this is all uh, subject to how you interpret history. Um, the day that the first atomic bomb was dropped on Hiroshima, the, the High Council in Japan that was talking about what to do about the war didn't even really care about that. They were more concerned with the fact that uh, the Russians were making their way to the East Coast and were just destroying everything in their path. So there are various ethical questions that come into play. The war was already at its end, really, before the bombs were dropped. People state that this speeded it up. Um, it was going to end it anyway. So it could have ended without the loss of a fifth of a million people. In any event, um, of course, there are much larger bombs. Um, so the Tsar Bomba was actually produced by Russia in the 50s and detonated um, somewhere in northern Russia. And it had a magnitude many, 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 many times greater than either of the bombs that were dropped on Japan. And of course, now we have bombs that are even larger than this. They're of fusion type. <laughs> And so here we have what is called the Peacekeeper Missile, which is a kind of an Orwellian name. But it's a, a missile that is loaded with seven other smaller missiles inside with the idea that those seven missiles are also all carrying nuclear warheads. <laughs> and so Peacekeeper, I guess, it's uh, supposed to be, you know, don't screw with us, or we'll send a missile that can basically make seven large mushroom clouds over seven different major cities if we are so inclined. So please keep the peace. That entails the chemistry of killing talk. Again, I apologize for not showing up uh, when it was supposed to on Tuesday. Uh, hopefully you found these videos. If you were able to make it through them, I know they were kind of lengthy. I, I apologize for that. But hopefully you found them informative and if you have any questions, please don't hesitate to send me something via email or if you want to stop by my office, um, that's all right as well. So thank you for listening and have a good night.